Hey, this is Pastor Spencer with Racine Bible Church. You're listening to a sermon from a Sunday morning. Amen. That hymn is an absolute banger. I love it with the drums and with the bass driving that kind of march. You know, that, that hymn has been putting steel into the spines of Christian women and men since Martin Luther wrote it back in the 1500s. What a great hymn for Christian courage. Relevant to our theme this morning out of 1 Peter 3. As we prepare to open God's word, let's uh, say a brief prayer and ask God to open our hearts. Lord God, you are our mighty fortress. In you we find rest, and in you we find a calling to live courageously in wicked times for your kingdom and for your glory. And so as we open your word now, we ask that you would equip us to live courageously in the times that we are in. What we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. And what we are not yet, make us. For your dear son's sake and in his name, amen. So men and women, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a uh, throwaway introductory line. That's actually the first point of the sermon. Men and women are different. There's a movement in our world, I hope that this is self-evident to you as it is to me, to blur the distinction between men and women in almost every way possible, a movement to blur the distinction between men and women. And that made my, that made kind of my spidey sense go off when uh, recently I heard from a pretty good Bible teacher who normally I trust this line. The Bible calls us to Christ-likeness, not so much to biblical manhood and womanhood. I like the first part of that. Of course, the Bible calls us to Christ-likeness, but I, my, my back teeth kind of hurt from the second half of that, not so much to biblical manhood and womanhood. That statement is a, a, what we'd call logically a, a category error. It pits good biblical truths against one another as if both of them cannot be equally beautiful, equally useful, and equally true at the same time. And a statement like that risks uh, undermining the beauty of God's design of manhood and womanhood in a world that is trying to erase that beauty and that design. It it is marvelously true that the Bible sure calls us to Christ-likeness. The Bible calls us to be saved by Christ. And after being saved by Christ and his work on the cross, which we just remembered at the the table, then it calls us to Christ-likeness. It certainly does. But the Bible sure does say that a God-honoring Christian life looks different in the particular calling to which you were called. And so of the several points that we'll make out of 1 Peter 3, 7 and related passages, the first one is simply this. Men and women, or husbands and wives, have different callings and different commands from God. They are both called to Christ-likeness, but they also have different callings and different commands specific to their manhood and their womanhood. Peter's whole point, if you look with me at chapter 3, Peter's whole point is that the calling to follow Christ, he says in chapter two, verse 21, that every Christian is called, 221, to follow in Christ's steps. But his whole point in these two pages is following Christ's steps looks different for a wife than it does for a husband. He says in three, one to six, what it looks like for a wife. He says in three, seven, what it looks like for a husband. And this is only the fourth or fifth iteration of how he says the calling looks different because he said in verse 13 and verse 14 and 15 that it looks different for a citizen of the government than it does for the governor. 
And then he said in verse 18 that it looks different for a servant or an employee than it does for the master or the owner of the facility in which that person is employed. Each position, each pathway, each position or pathway has different principles, different commandments, different responsibilities, and faces different challenges. Christ-likeness assumes a certain shape, particularly for women and wives, and it assumes a different shape, particularly for men and husbands. There was a book published last year that I think needed to be published and needs to be widely read. I really enjoyed it. The title of the book is Courage, How the Gospel Creates Christian Fortitude. The author is Joe Rigney, and it's just a little maybe six-chapter book, a little paperback, but one of the chapters is titled Courage and the Sexes, and he does a marvelous job there explaining what courage looks like for women and what courage looks like for men. And in that book, he says that courage is common to men and women, just like Christ-likeness is common to men and women. But by God's design, courage is inflected by our sex. I didn't say infected, like courage got COVID, inflected. And I I had to like learn again what that is. Inflection, you see it in language, in grammar. Just had a bunch of people come back from Honduras, right? Spanish language, hermano, hermana different inflection, remember? Hermano, brother. Hermana, sister. You have the same root, herman, meaning sibling. And then you have an inflection, either an A or an O at the end because it's different for sister than it is for brother. Courage is courage. Courage is courage all the way down, whether it's in men or in women whether it's a risk-taking male warrior who is out there with the sword and the shield on the battlefield, or whether it's 1 Peter 3, 6, Sarah in courageous Christian femininity submitting to and obeying her husband. See, courage is courage whether in a man or a woman, but courage is expressed differently all the way down. Because we are embodied and we live our lives in the in the in the sex and in the calling and in the role relationships that God has given to us. So we manifest that courage in distinctly masculine or distinctly feminine ways. You see that very clearly here in verses one through six, where the courage of the woman is shown in her submission, in her respectful and pure conduct, in her prizing of the inner rather than the outer, in a world that promises rewards for the outer and no rewards for the inner. She shows a a courageous sort of Daniel-like refusal to go the Babylonian way of just focusing on the outside when she focuses on the inside. And then particularly in how she follows her husband's leadership. That's a courageous move that Sarah made. But then you see that the husbandly courage or the masculine courage is different because he says in verse seven, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. We spent a couple of weeks actually on verses one through six. We spent last week, explaining and interpreting verse seven. And this week I wanna come back to it with a little bit of a more global look at what it means to be a courageous man or how to be a godly man who honors God and whose prayer life really works. So our first point is simply that men and women, husbands and wives have different callings and different commands from God. That leads us to our second point, which is the, 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 the most basic way to outline or to express or to billboard that calling that the husband or the father or the man has. And that's this, men and husbands are called to leadership and authority. Men and husbands are called to leadership and authority. This is implied, but strongly implied, not just a guess, in verse one, when it says that the wife is to submit to or to follow the leadership of her husband. Same thing in verse five. The women of God adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. And then it's implied also in what P. 
Peter says to the husband in verse 7, though he doesn't literally use the word leadership. Uh, Peter has his own way of talking about leadership and authority, but uh, Paul calls it headship in Ephesians and in 1 Corinthians 11. And uh, Peter calls the elders of the church in chapter 5, he says the elders are to lead or shepherd, provide direction to the flock. And then what, what 1 Peter 5 says about elders, that elders are called to lead in the church, then Paul gives us backing teaching on that in Titus 1 and in 1 Timothy 3, both of which state that the elders of the church are the men of the church, the, those particular men who are called to eldership because God's design and calling is for men to lead in the church as in the home, in the household of faith as in the household of God. So what is leadership and authority? If the point is that men and husbands are called to leadership and authority, we better define leadership and authority. And like a lot of things, the, the, I think for teaching purposes, the best way to get at it is to first say what it isn't. And after you've sort of blacked out what it isn't, the picture of what it is pops off the page a little clearer. What is leadership and authority biblically? First, what it's not. It's not self-serving. It's not self-serving. Jesus said, I've come to lead you. And Jesus says to his disciples, I'm leaving so that you can lead the church. And precisely there in Mark 10 <clears throat> and the parallel passages, <clears throat> he, says that, he says that leadership in my kingdom is not like it is among the Gentiles. The leaders among the Gentiles lead in self-serving ways. The leaders in my kingdom lead in self-sacrificial ways. This is the difference. You see that in, that in that beautiful paragraph in Mark 10, 43, 44, and 45. Leadership, biblically, in Christ-like way, is not self-serving. Actually, just see it in 1 Peter. Turn over to chapter 5, verse 1. I exhort the elders among you, 5, 1, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory." He says in verse two, not for self-serving gain financially. And then he says in verse three, not in a self-aggrandizing way where you domineer and lord over people. That's the opposite of Christ-honoring leadership. So this authority and leadership is not self-serving. It follows the example of Jesus Christ. Husbands and fathers, make everyone in the family safe by demanding no safety for themselves, by sacrificing their own comfort and their own safety to keep everyone else comfortable and safe. Husbands and fathers provide for others in the family by keeping back as little as possible for themselves and by sharing everything they can with their family. This is what husbands and fathers do because this is what Jesus Christ did for us. When husbands don't do this and husbands use their strength and their authority to make themselves comfortable, they deny the whole purpose of God. It's a, a horrible thing to encounter domestic abuse in the household. It is a horrible thing to encounter what we just read in 1 Peter 5, um, a sort of uh, spiritual lording it over and domineering the flock by elders in the household of God. Both of those are ungodly. Specifically, if I could put it this way, both of those are ungodly in Trinitarian terms. They're ungodly for they're utterly unlike God the Father who creates and protects and provides all things. And it, the, both of those manifestations of ungodly leadership are ungodly in Christ-like ways, the second member of the triune God. Because Jesus Christ came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a sacrifice for many. And any form of abusive 
<clears throat> or domineering leadership is ungodly in the, according to the third member of the Trinity because <clears throat> it's utterly anti-Holy Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit, the radiant evidence of the power of the Spirit is agape love and self-control and kindness. So if leadership and authority is not self-serving, what is it in biblical terms? I'd simply say this, authority and leadership in biblical terms is um, the responsibility to make decisions and the responsibility to protect and direct the rest of the organization. Maybe we could say it's the authority to make decisions and the responsibility to protect and direct the whole. It's the authority to make decisions because if you have the responsibility to direct the whole, you have to have the authority to make the decisions of which path we ought to go on. And we see that throughout the New Testament that that's how the elders lead the church. And we see that throughout the New Testament that that's how the father leads the family or the husband leads the family. It's called headship. And headship means that you are responsible to, 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 to guide and direct the family and you have the authority to do so. But you know what else headship means? Headship means that you sacrifice first. It means that you do the hard thing first. It means that you're cut open and your blood flows first. It means that whatever bad thing happens, you take absolutely as much of the weight of that bad thing as you possibly can so that it does not transfer to your wife, to your kids. You take the hurt first. This is not just traditional teaching about manhood. If I could show you, this is actually, it, 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 maybe it sounds funny to put it this way. This isn't just teaching in the Bible, though it is teaching in the Bible. This is actually embedded in the creational fabric of the cosmos in which we live and move and breathe. Genesis 1. So we're, we just finished Genesis in our ABFs, our Adult Bible Fellowships. We're in a little doctrinal study now that's very practical and helpful. And then the next book that we'll tackle is Exodus. But there was so, there were so many good things <clears throat> in Genesis. And if you remember in Genesis chapter one, how did God make a woman? By cutting open a dude. The only one that was there, Adam. He cuts him open takes out a rib and creates the woman. But we can actually see this in the pattern of the entire creation week. This is why I'm saying this is, this is embedded in the, in the creational fabric of the cosmos. Because Genesis 1, I, I, I won't take the time to read it. I trust that many of you are familiar with it. You see the pattern. God creates and then he divides. God divides the light from the darkness in verses four and five of Genesis one. Then God divides the waters above from the waters below in verses six and seven. And then he gathers all the waters under the heaven together and he divides them from the dry ground, the oceans and the land in verses nine and 10 of Genesis one. And then in the culmination of the creational activity, God takes Adam, humanity, and he breaks it open and divides it to create Adama, the woman, Eve. This is what it means, husband, to be the head of your wife. It means that if someone gets cut open, it's you. If someone has to bleed, it's you. What does that mean practically? What that means practically is that you wake up every day and you pray, ah, uh, how do I make life better for my kids, my wife, my church? You do not wake up every day saying, why isn't my life better? And why doesn't my wife do this? Why don't my kids do that? Why doesn't my church do the other? You don't live that way. That's a boyish, childish, ungodly way to live. You wake up every day, you say, how do I, how do I make life better for them? How do I lighten the load for them? 
How can I, how can I use my best efforts to carve out the worst bits for myself so that others can get the best? Leadership is authority to make decisions and then the responsibility to protect and to provide and guide the whole, whether it's a family or whether it's the church, whether we're talking about a husband in the family or an elder in the church. Elders lead the church by making decisions. Now, it even says there in 1 Peter 5 that the elders are among the flock and they don't domineer over the flock, which means that though I strongly believe in elder rule in the church, uh, it, it's not as if the elders are here and the church is here. The elders are among the church. And the way that the elders rule the church is by communicating with the church, listening to the church, understanding the church's needs, being taught by the women and men in the church, dialogue, dialogue kind of teaching, that, that, like their helpful perspectives are given to the elders. Same way with the husband. The husband is responsible to make the decisions, but a godly husband discusses all decisions carefully with his wife, and he listens to his wife. And he says, he says to himself, God gave me this wife because God knows what I need. And God knows that I didn't have to learn how to ignore someone more and more and more. God knows what I need is her perspective, is her wisdom, is her love. Wisdom is priceless. And yet, with all that said, at the end of of the day, if a decision needs to be made, then it's the elders who make that decision, it's the husband who makes that decision, who are ultimately responsible to make that decision. If there's a deadlock, the husband decides, so to speak. And then what happens? Then what happens? Well... If they were like, I want to go this way, I want to go that way, and the husband decides which way they're going to go. Then what happens? Then what happens? What happens is, if it goes well, if it goes well, the husband, I'm not, I mean, maybe this is funny, but I don't mean for it to be funny. If it goes well, the husband does everything that he can to funnel the glory and the good consequences of that decision to the wife. What if it goes bad? What if it goes bad? Then the husband does everything that he can to funnel the garbage and the backflow from that bad decision to himself so that she doesn't have to bear the brunt of any of it. Husbands and fathers, just like elders in the church, are given the responsibility to provide, to guide, and they're given the authority to make decisions. And it is most certainly the case, isn't it, that uh, if, if a husband's in authority or the elder is in authority, he has to do everything he can to show the people who are under his authority that he himself is under the authority of God. So it should be extremely common for you congregants to hear the elders of this church say, well, the Bible says that we should do this. It should be uncommon for you to hear the elders of the church say, well, a lot of people want us to do it this way or we've always done it that way. That, that, that's not our authority. It's the word of God. And same with the husband and the father in the household. I, I, I want this to be a church with fathers who lovingly discipline their kids but it's got to be a church where fathers lovingly discipline their kids with their Bibles open so that kids see that the father himself is accountable and under the authority of God just like the kid is. Otherwise, if you don't do that, what do you do? You exasperate or you drive people away in this sort of crazy making where some man who's the elder or the dad says, well, I'm the leader and I lead according to my arbitrary moods. That's a perfect way to instill insecurity in your flock, whether your flock be a church or a household. And it's the way to make them uh, uh, basically uh, exasperated by you. So men and women are different. The difference is that the man, the husband, is called to lead and show authority, but we must speed to our third point, which is just as important as that point on leadership, and it's this. Men and husbands are to love sacrificially. That's point number three. Men and husbands are to love sacrificially. 
Now, we gotta go to a few other verses for this because I think it's under the surface in 3.7, but Peter doesn't use the word agape, but certainly it's present there when he says that the husband shows understanding toward his wife and he shows honor toward his wife. And the fact that in some ways she's weaker than him is never an excuse for him to uh, distance himself from her or to domineer over her, but the fact that she's weaker than him is the, is the way for him to, to, to use that and his greater strength to love her and to honor her and to grant her honor as the fellow heir of the grace of life. So I think this concept of love is present in 1 Peter 3, 7, but I think it's, a, a, well, not I think, it's bluntly put in Colossians 3:18. Colossians 3.18, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. In keeping with the sort of theme that Peter took six verses to talk to the ladies because ladies are patient and they like to talk about everything and the theme that Peter took one verse to talk to the men because men are blockheaded and you just have to say it very strong and very direct. Like he just says, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. It's put more beautifully in Ephesians chapter 5, where the same apostle that wrote Colossians writes, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives. Oh, that comparative, that comparative as clause is, is, is worthy of daily meditation. As Christ loved the church, because if you would meditate on that, you would bring yourself back to the gospel every time you meditated, and then the self who's abiding in and imbibing the gospel would actually become the kind of self who can love your wife that way, because it's not coming out of your own strength, it's coming out of your abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In keeping with the format that Peter gave us, that the commands to the husband ought to be blunt and brief, I'll, men, husbands, I'll explain the two ways that you need to love your wife. Love your wife in all ways and love your wife for always. Two L's in the first, one L in the second. Love your, love your wife in all ways and love your wife always first. Love your wife in all ways. Love her by being her physical protector and provider. Christ protects the church. He protects the flock. He lays down his life for the flock, not the other way around. Love her through physical provision. Work hard to be the main breadwinner in your home. Love her through spiritual leadership. This is where a lot of men struggle. For some reason, it's like, okay to get up and go to work in the morning. We're not, maybe some of you aren't doing that and that's where you need to work at, but I find over the years that it's the, the, the spiritual provision that's a little bit more challenging. This is where most men abdicate because they feel like their wife is more spiritual than them or they're this or that or the other thing, but uh, you're called to love your wife by providing spiritual leadership. Ephesians 5 says, by washing her in the water of the word. That means... Men, that you need to spend the best of your mental energies on, uh, and, and the best of your exertions on your family's spiritual good. Hear this. It sounds simple, but this would be revolutionary for some of you because some of you are spending your best financial energies, your best mental energies, and, and your best physical energies on your family's economic good or your kid's scholarly good that they do well in school or your kids athletic good that they do well in sports and all those things have their place but you are accountable before God to spend the best of your heart on your family's spiritual good this means that your concerns are not merely what can be seen in the horizon of this world like a college scholarship or success in this or that or the other thing it means that your horizon is Christ-likeness, to follow Christ, to be a vibrant member of the church. This means that you're concerned about your wife's holiness 
and you will do everything you can to lead her in the ways of holiness. Love your wife in all ways. He says live with your wife in an understanding way. There may be a a sort of um, respectful, almost shy reference to the conjugal rights of the marriage bed in that in that very phrase. But husbands are called to love their wives physically and intimately. It says in 1 Corinthians 7, husband, that your body is not your own. But God's good and marvelous design is that you would use your body for the pleasure, the happiness, the fulfillment of your wife. Love her in all ways. And second, love her for always. Your commitment is supposed to be permanent. Your commitment is supposed to be permanent. I know for some of you it hasn't been, but your commitment is supposed to be permanent because it's modeled on Christ's commitment to you. And if, if Christ's commitment to me could be cut off because I'm unworthy, where, where would I be? Where would I be? Love her for always. Another hint that I get out of 1 Peter 3, 7 when it says, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman. I think it, it reminds me, I hope it reminds you that if you're married, there should be an increasing amount of attentiveness and affection the greater the number of years that you're married. This is how it ought to be. There should be an increasing amount of attentiveness and affection for the increasing amount of years that you've been married. And this is easy to understand from the inverse of it. When do men put in the time? When they're trying to win the woman. The very beginning of the relationship. They put in the time and the affection and the attention to impress her, to get her to look their way, to say yes, whatever it is they're wanting. They they, they put in the time. And then as the years go on, the attentiveness and the affection decrease. I actually think a proper way to read it, precisely what Peter is saying here, is that it should go the other way. Whatever attentiveness and affection you started with, it should increase because part of the grace of life is that he's given you this woman to rejoice over all of the days of your flesh. Praise her inner and outer beauty. Put in the time to win her. She needs to know that you find her uh, marvelously, physically attractive on the outside, and she needs to know that you prize more than anything the spiritual beauty of her spirit on the inside. You need to comfort her when she's hurting. You need to listen to her longer than you think you do. In every one of these ways, you are communicating to her that you cherish her above all others and that you will do so forever. Men and husbands are to love sacrificially. None of this will happen unless you you will join me in doing the fourth point. Men and husbands are to lead in repentance. Here we'll zero a little bit more in on verse seven. And then at the very end, I'll tell you what it means that your prayers may not be hindered. Men and husbands are to lead in repentance. What is the best thing you can do for your family? If you're a single man in this congregation, What is the best thing you can do for the family of God? If you are a married man, what is the best thing you can do for your family? The answer is the same, and I'll give you the answer. What is the best thing you can do for the family of God? What is the best thing you can do for your family? Here's the answer. Will you listen? Here it is. Repent of your sin. Repent of your sin. In verse 7, He says that if you don't repent of the sin of mistreating your wife, your prayers will be hindered. You see that? So that your prayers may not be hindered. If you sin by not living with your wife or not living with her with understanding or not showing her honor, then your refusal to repent of that sin means your prayers won't be answered. It's it's exactly what he says in, uh, look a little further down in chapter three, look at verses um, 10 and 11. Who desires to love life and see good days, 
Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Repent of your sin and and restore yourself to the graciousness, the goodness of the face of the Lord. Repent of your sin. Peter's all about repentance of sin. He said in chapter one, verses 14 and 15, as obedient children, quit being conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, so you be holy in all your conduct, 1 Peter 1, 14 and 15. 1 Peter 2, verse 11, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Repentance is urgent, Repentance is vital, and I'll tell you why. Repentance is urgent and vital because your sin is harming you more than you think it is, and your sin is harming the people around you more than you think it is. Your sin is damaging your grandchildren, your children, and your wife. Your sin is damaging these sweet, kind people that are sitting in the chairs next to you who don't deserve to be damaged by your sin, but they will be damaged by your sin if you're a covenant member of this church. Satan is the father of lies. Sin is lies and deceit. Perhaps the the lie that spurns like a spider giving birth to a million spiders out of its belly. Perhaps the lie that sin just just breaks open with is, uh, my sin will only affect me. The worst lies of all. My sin will stay secret. My sin will stay contained. That's a lie. But my, the, the consequences of my sin won't spread out to others. It's a dastardly lie. You know, sin never introduces itself because sin can't help but lie. But if we, if, we, if we just gave sin a truth serum and it had to tell the truth when it introduced itself to us, this is what it would say. Hello, my name is Sin. I am your deadly enemy and I hate you so much that I don't just want to ruin your life, but I want my foothold in your life to ruin the lives of everyone around you who you love. That's my plan. Will you be my friend? Your sin is harming you more than you think it is. And your sin is harming the precious people in your family and your church more than you think it is. So you need to repent of it. Confess it. Throw it away. What is repentance? You know that old King James translation of the Proverbs? Like a dog who returns to its vomit, so is a sinner who returns to his sin. Whatever's the opposite of that, that's repentance. That's repentance. That's repentance. What are some sins that we need to repent of, men? 1 Peter 3, 7, the sin of dishonoring your wife, the sin of not understanding her or even caring to understand her the sin of harshness, the sin of anger. Many men need to forthwith repent of the sin of pornography. There are a lot of good resources about that, accountability about that. Just reach out to one of our elders, one of our ABF leaders. We can help you with that. The sin of apathy, the sin of abdication of spiritual leadership, the sin of neglect. Get a a mentor who's a little ahead of you and just get going. Take a couple steps. So important that we take the lead in repentance. And then fifth and finally, and here's where we'll explain the end of verse seven, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Men and husbands are especially accountable to have a prayer life that works. So I'll give you a little interpretation of the end of verse seven, which, where he says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Treat your wives this way so that your prayers may not be hindered. And this is, there is some, there is some hot, hot fire in this little way that he ends this verse. So, Prayer. Uh, Forgive me for saying things that are obvious. Don't be bored by them. We'll move along from them quickly. Prayer is important. Prayer is really, really important. But none of us treat it like it is. Exactly the same tautology as in eating healthy. No one here can successfully argue that eating a poor diet is better than eating a healthy diet. 
but nobody in here is as good as they ought to be at eating a good diet. Same with prayer. We, we can't argue that it's not important, but we just know by our, by our own inability to do it or our unwillingness to do it that we don't treat it as importantly as we should. Why is prayer important? Because prayer is at the heart of the Christian walk. Prayer is the only way you relate everything in your life to your relationship with God. Say that again. Prayer is really the only way that you relate everything in your life to your relationship with God. So prayer is at the heart of our devotion because prayer is at the heart of our actual relationship with God. If I can go through all these things in life and never talk to God about them, then I don't have much of a relationship with God or my relationship with God is sort of religious, but it doesn't touch my real life. Prayer is how your real life relates to God. Without prayer, we are practical atheists. I do not spend a lot of my time debating atheists. But I spend a lot of my time, forgive me, I don't mean to harm you, I mean to help you. I spend a lot of my time with church members who are practical atheists. They would never argue for atheism, but their prayerlessness turns them, not verbally, but more importantly, vibrantly and actively, into practical atheists. Prayer is that important. It's the only way you relate everything in your life to God. So if prayer is that important, and it is, then we should be astonished by the end of verse seven. I mean, it it should be eye-popping. If prayer is that important, and it is, and Peter directly connects a husband's attitude and action toward his wife to the core of the husband's actual relationship with God, doesn't that make this whole thing ultra-important? Isn't Peter saying something like this? Husband, when you pray, God has the right to see and hear your prayers through your treatment of your wife. That's the filter. That's the filter. God has the right to do that. Or we might say, husband, vocalize this. Lord God, would you listen to my prayer just as well as I listen to my wife, please, amen. Is that not what he's saying? There's some mystery to it that is beyond my comprehension in the sovereignty of God, but he's saying something like that. For years, I have been teaching, and I'll still teach it, that if you want a stronger marriage, you have to work on your prayer life. And I'll still teach that because that's an okay way to teach. But I, I kind of think, I, I was in a dialogue with Peter and the Holy Spirit, not really, I'm just saying like in my study. Like I've been teaching that and Peter and the Holy Spirit are like, mm, no. Actually, let's go the other way around. Tell them that they should improve their marriage so that their prayer life will improve. What a, what a thing for the living God to say. What a challenge for him to roll out before us. Isn't it just God saying that, hey, men of the church, your claim to have a relationship with God is utterly vacuous and hollow if you don't have a good relationship with your wife. It is as simple as that. So do you? And are you willing to, to do what you can to try? Let me turn the warning into an invitation to hope because uh, if there was no Holy Spirit and no Jesus, we could all leave bruised and beaten up about how awful we are. But there is a Holy Spirit who Jesus sended because he sent to us because he rose from the grave. So there's hope here. Man, if you will listen to this sermon and you will begin to, I almost said apply it, scratch that. If you will listen to this sermon and ask Ask the living God to help you apply it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Because if you listen to a sermon like this and you ask the living God to help you apply it, this is, what's that. this is what it's like. You're asking God to do the very thing that he wanted to do, which is why he inspired this text. It's a win, 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 win all the way down. You are in the exact same position as the sixth grader in school who comes early and knocks on the teacher's door and the teacher says yes and the little sixth grader says, hey teacher, can I please sit in the front row, 
take good notes, do a perfect job on all my reports, and pass all the tests and clean the blackboard for you. What teacher is not gonna say yes? You are in exactly the same position as my sweet little Trixie, my granddaughter is, when she came up to me just a couple of weeks ago, she said, she said, Grandpa, can I snuggle up next to you and can you read me 18 storybooks? Yes! There is nothing I'd rather do than read you. That, 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 that's the joy of my life. You're in exactly the same position, husband, as if you said to your wife, hey, hey, honey, can I, can I buy you gifts like a lot and tell you how beautiful you are and mean it? Like, if you hear a sermon like this and you will on your knees, perhaps with fasting, say, God, would you please help me apply this? The, the very heart of God uh, will move into your heart to help you by his grace and for his glory. Let's pray. Lord God, bless the preaching of your word to the lifelong, deep heart application in the lives of the women and the men who are here. Those who are single, maybe too young to be married or not yet married, or those who are single because of a death or a divorce, apply these words in their lives by your spirit. And those who are married, apply these in a unique way, in a life-giving way to their marriages. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. To find out more about our ministry, contact us at racinebible.org. Thank you for listening.